The following program is brought to you by Caltech. It's a pleasure to introduce Paulus Protopapas from Center for Astrophysics. And she's a senior scientist and project manager and lead investigator of the Time Series Center. Sounds very impressive. And Pavel's got his PhD in nuclear physics, but we don't hold that against him. He since discovered astronomy. He worked with Charles Alcock on microlensing and other fun things like that. Um, and um, I'll let him tell us all about machine learning and statistics applications in time domain analysis. Thank you, thank you for inviting me. Um, I think there's some time problem in Caltech because when he asked me to give a talk, he said, senior graduate students and postdocs. And I look around, there are a lot of senior graduate students with gray hair in the auditorium, so I'll, yeah, I'll take it from there. So um, yes, I'm Pavlos Protobabas. I'm uh, at CFA in uh, the Institute of Applied Computational Science, that's uh, the School of Engineering Applied Science at Harvard. And I'm talking here with Time Series Group. There's many people, I just didn't want to put all the names there, but I'll mention them as I go. It's actually some conspirators are here, Uma is here, which used to be with us a few years back. Um, so just quickly, uh, just want to say something, the time series used to be started by the Initiative in Innovative Computing, IIC, you may hear that. Since then, uh, in 2010, we moved to something new, it's the Institute of Applied Computational Sciences. Um, so the focus now is, is in educating um, the new um, graduate, graduate students in computational science, and actually I, I just finished teaching the first course in stochastic processes. There's gonna be many, many courses coming next semester. Uh, I want to just go quickly through that, but I have a lot to talk. Uh, so the idea that I think other people share in this room is you combine data, you combine science questions, and traditionally we used to stop there, or we combine analysis tools, which basically that's where computer scientists and statisticians come in. It used to be a claim either these two or these two, um, or sometimes even these two, I think putting all together, meaning having real data, having the questions, and putting the analysis tools has been new the last five, six years. I think, again, many people in this room share this vision. Uh, so this is what we're trying to do, we're trying to combine all these three together. And it's only interesting when you have a large data set, otherwise it's, it's MATLAB code. So not that there's anything wrong with that, but uh, the, the challenge comes from, 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 from that. So, uh, we've been collecting data for some time. Um, just want to mention a few started with Macho and Eros, Ogol. This is uh, solar system data. And nowadays we start collecting PANSTARS data. Um, people seem to forget PANSTARS is going on. But there's a lot of data, data coming in and we're struggling to keep up. Uh, I said the LSST is going to be a lot. We're just far from there. Don't worry about that. So let me go through the wish list. Um, I put the wish list because that's how I started thinking what are the problems we're trying to solve. Well, first of all is classifications. We heard from previous talk, a nice talk, uh, how you can do that. Um, the basic idea is we want to classify objects based on their variability characteristics. It's talking about time domain. Well, you could use other things traditionally actually being used by color magnitude diagrams, but what we're trying to introduce is is the variability characteristics. So you want to have a program or a method or a box that you give a light curve, a time series, and other things, and it give, gives you something, what it is, with some probability. Again, the previous talk addressed that. I will talk a little bit about, about that too. Second, which became kind of byproduct to that, and it's been my passion the last six months, is that to do classification, especially when you involve periodic light curves, you need to know what a period is. And I thought that problem was solved. Um, Jeff has solved that partially, but it's becoming more of interesting for me because when we're trying to do classification, the Lomskarkel was failing in, in, in some cases, so we wanted to, to improve that. 
Um, so here you can show you some light curves. This is an AGN, a QS quasar. This is a periodic one, it's an eclipsing binary. And I think this is supernova. So you can see the difference in the morphology of the light curve. It should be easy, it should be doable. Um, another thing I think Rosanne asked is the question, so I'm nice to have my third slide answering that, is the novelty detection. Uh, traditionally, a lot of discoveries in astronomy have been done by serendipity discoveries. Uh, I mentioned three major discoveries. Uh, pulsars, that was, they were looking for quasars and they found pulsars. Uh, CMB, they were looking for something else, they found CMB. And even the four Juvian moons I found out by looking yesterday, Galileo was not looking for the moons, but was looking for other things. So looking into the data and exploring and finding something else being traditionally how science been done. Now we have these terabytes of data and this problem has start becoming away from us. We can look through the data, we can do serendipitous discovery. So what we introduce here, what we're trying to do is, is we have this machine learning and statistics and computer science methods to aid us. I don't think they're gonna always solve our problems, but they can aid us, go from the billions of objects to a few hundred that we can always look. So I call it exploratory tools more than um, data mining tools, but so wish list continuous event detection. Um, again, there was a talk before me who did nothing better. Just introduced this by a block by Bayesian, but the idea of finding events, and I have here three events that I care, but there are many more. This is a micro lensing event. Uh, this is from Ogul. Uh, here is it's a stellar flare, Christian 2005. I should have put that. And this is an occultation event. This is something I spend half of my time is looking for uh, when a rock uh, the edges of the outer solar system goes in front of a star. This looks nice because it's synthetic, because none been detected except one. Um, so uh, this is what we're looking to find. Um, so we need to have tools that, for example, I need to give an example. Tau has been observed for five years, has four telescopes, three telescopes operating at 10 her five hertz, and I think about a few, few thousand stars at any given time. And so far, nothing has been found. But you have to process all this data to find that event. So you need to be sensitive to signal to noise, and you need to be efficient. Otherwise, you won't be able to catch up. Um, and eventually, my wish list has time series modeling. And something, again, become my passion since I was teaching that course. I start giving homework to the students, and I will start seeing interesting stuff. So I start getting interested into that. So the challenges. Well, we have to educate astronomers in machine learning statistics. Okay, we've been doing that. Uh, myself, self-taught. Uh, the large data sets, look, the macho data in the 90s was one terabyte, Sloan was 40 terabytes, Panstar is two terabytes per night, and Sloan is gonna be, and eh, LSST is gonna be even bigger. So the data rate is increasing. I don't know if we can catch up. In time domain, the regular sampling is it's, it's an issue because uh, we don't take data at regular samples most of the time. Uh, my data actually, some of the times is that they're, they're pretty good, but if you see supernova data, this data, 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 nothing, another color. So these kind of data are not meant, I mean, the, the, most of the algorithms don't assume that. And here I have uh, the noise. Um, again, most of the algorithms assume white noise, uh, but we have red, blue, purple, I don't know what is blue and purple, they just make things up, uh, noise, um, that sometimes not even stable or stationary. So you can, I can show you light curves that the first two hours is, is nice, wide noise, you can fit it, and then it goes into some bizarre world. So a lot of these models of event detection and I think assume that you, at least your noise is stable uh, or see the same. Uh, and finally, the dealing with the cultures, this is where the joke comes, you know, an astronomer and a statistician and a mathematician, what is, you know, and you can make your own joke. I have plenty of them, I can tell you later. <laughs> but there is cultures. Uh, there's three different, four different cultures. There, there is the astronomer culture, uh, which means 100 is, is equal to one. There is the engineering, which is always approximate, and there's the mathematicians that are precise, and then there's computer science somewhere in between that. So a lot of times we talk 
It's about the same thing in a different language. And again, this, this is the group of people that start speaking most all of the languages, but it's not the norm in, in astronomy at least. Okay, so I'm gonna jump into classification now. And I feel like uh, this gave such a nice talk that uh, maybe I'm gonna go fast through that and go to the next one. Uh, what we did, um, we use what we have about the data, basically color, magnitude, period estimations. You see I emphasize period estimations and not period. And the light curve morphology, the shape of the light curve. We use a poor vector machine. Um, and what we did in this example, we analyzed the whole macho and Eros database, all of it. So we start from the beginning to the end. No pre-processing, no filtering, no nothing. It's just for each light curve, we get its light curve, we get the color and magnitude, and we train a, 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 a SVM model by looking at what Ogle did. Ogle did this careful classification. They used some automation, some by hand, and they, we use that as to train. We train the SVM, and then we use it on the whole, um, on the whole match and error data set. Um, so we use cross-correlation as our kernel for, we start by using the cross-correlation kernel for the morphology similarity. So if you have two light curves, you want to know if they are similar or not. Uh, I forgot to mention this, this thing is about periodic light curves. I'll talk about non-periodic in a sec. So we use cross-correlation, the maximum over the phase, because in periodic light curves, the epoch, the phase is irrelevant, it doesn't matter if when the first transit happened or when the event happens. So, um, so the first thing we used was this one, but then we found that uh, from, and that, uh, uh, from uh, computer scientists, I think even it was Uma, who said that this is not post, uh, positive semi-definite. So we needed to get away from that. So we invented a different kernel, which basically takes the the cross correlation, but it doesn't maximize, you sum the expon exponential of that. So the one that is maximum is of course gonna jump out, it's like a soft maximum, that's positive semi-definite. So the results, let me get straight to the results, we found 14,000 new periodic variable stars that were not found before by the traditional methods. And the reason is because the traditional methods use these clean cuts. Anything that is, it has variability more than this. Uh, variance is is variable, and anything below that is not. But sometimes variable stars may exhibit less variability, but have other characteristics. So by doing this, we found, as I say, 14,000 new periodic variable stars. Uh, and what is great about that is that we have a handle of deficiency. We do know how many we're missing, because we can, we can test it, because we start from the beginning to the end. And so we can make inferences. I mean, we're writing a paper now claiming we know what is the percentage of multiple stars in the galaxy, or at least in the LMC, which is an important thing because we can only do it because we start from the beginning to the end. Uh, so this is what the light curves look like. Well, this is in wrong order, but uh, this is the light curves. We, only, we concentrate on three major uh, light curves types, three major types. This is what the traditional way was doing, is just color magnitude diagram. Uh, these are three types. You can see they kind of split nicely. However, there's mixture here and here. And if you do the traditional way of, of doing this, you get 80% right. What we got, we got 99.9% right. That's when I cross-validate with the ogle that is known. Uh, um, we did some follow-ups on the macho and we're, we haven't found a mistake yet. So this is again how I combine the kernels because I have a kernel that deals with the similarity of the shapes. I have a kernel that deals with the color, period, and magnitude. They just linearly combine them and optimize for these coefficients. And these are some of the light curves because uh, Charles Alco, who was a PI of the macho, and he didn't believe me. So I have to print a lot of them and show them. And you can see now that those are real variables that were missed. All right, so now we're going to non-periodic one. So what we're trying to do now is because of the, if there's no periodic, the shape of the light curve is kind of ambiguous. So what we're trying to extract features now out of the light curve. So what do we do? Instead of being very smart, we've been uh, 
brute force. Basically, we took the literature for about variability, and took every single variability index that we could find, and we just say, okay, it's a feature in our feature vector. At the end of the day, only 13, because some of them are the same. So 13, actually there are 13 features, one is the color, so it's 12 features that, that describe variability. From auto regression to auto correlation to what uh, she was saying, the two dimensional auto regression model to uh, Ed Stanton K to some, some, what is the statistic, some cum cumulative sum to anything we could find from literature in astronomy and other fields. So we create another SBN using all this. Um, so for training set, this was a problem because it's not a good training set. We only have 50 known QSOs in the Macho database. Uh, 58, I have a, this is 50 we use because eight of them were in a different field. 128 B stars, and then we put anything we could do. is make a big soup of training set we could find, and we're sure that these are blood type. Um, this is how they look like. Now the problem is you can see the B stars up here and the QSOs have very similar variability characteristics. And that's been the case. Um, as I mentioned here, previous work for doing that, they did cuts, 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 and they end up with 2,500, and only 2% 2 of them were really QSOs. And the major things they have was the B stars. So as you can see from the shape, they look similar. Um, all right, where are my results? So, we did 650 we found that did not, actually I'm missing something here. I, mean, I say it in words. We end up with 1600 candidates. And then we went to confirm them because our training set was kind of iffy, we needed to confirm it. We did, we took a cross correlate with the Spitzer data. We did, I don't want to get into details, but to the point we get spectra and we have 650 of them to be true. So we have an efficiency of 30%. And what we're doing now, we use this as our training model and we redo the whole thing. And right now we're getting 92% or 90%. And we have a program to get the new candidates we got to see how well we do. And we're gonna keep doing that until we, 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 we're done with that. But right now we're very happy where we are. So, so I want to go to anomaly detection because it's an important aspect. So again, I want to find out the few things that they don't look like anything else. That's an important aspect to what we do. Um, so actually, Umas, I have a paper before in 2006, and we used Euclidean distance. Basically what we did, we took every light curve, compared it to every light curve, and find the ones that they don't look like anything else. We found the oddballs, the weirdos, uh, from our data set, not including us. Um, the problem, the couple of problems, one is again, we're looking for periodic variables, so the phasing has to be dealt with because you can move things. Uh, so in this paper, I use universal phasing. Basically what I did, I took the highest point and I just fix it. Uh, UMA in 2009 extended k-means to pk-means uh, to, to fix that problem. And uh, it's basically, f well, you searching in the k-means, you fix in the face at the same time. Is you do, instead of using Euclidean, this thing you use cross correlation. And I think you prove in that paper that that converges. Is that right? Yes. Uh, so you just uh, the yeah. you can still have No, no stretching. We don't do stretching. You remember these are periodic, so you fold it into one period. So the, the stretch is one period. Right? But we don't do what is, uh, we don't do stretching as, uh, what is it called? Uh, there, is a, there is a way you start stretching things is in, 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 in comparison of time series. The name escapes me now. Uh, but we don't do that because that it means you stretch a part of the time series different from another one. And I can't think of real physical problem that that certain things happen faster and certain things don't happen faster. We could do that. Um, and then we have another work now which is using active learning method by 
Said Majidi, which basically does the same thing, but again, he presents to me a bunch of light cases. He said, do you think anything of this is weird? And I said, yes, yes, no, 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 no. And then he retrains and he keeps doing that. Uh, so the other thing, I have time. The other thing we did is event detection. So I'm moving away from model detection, go down to my wish list. Event detection, uh, this is one thing that I think was motivated by John Rice. He may uh, say no, but it is that. So basically, we, we're trying to do this event detection by using scan statistics. We take a window and we scan through the time series and we sum up the fluxes within the window. Very simple, it's fast, it's linear. Um, and then you compare that statistics S with some null hypothesis. What we found very quickly is again that the, the, the error, the noise is not stable. So you need to keep knowing what's the null at every subset. And that became very expensive because the only way to do that is reshuffling your light curve and that become very expensive. So we walk away from that problem and what we, we did, we, we as I said here, we need a p-value or the, the, the null hypothesis. Um, so one way of doing it is to reshuffle, but that's too expensive. The other one is to, is to model the noise. But again, that's not easy. Most of the cases, the tails of the distribution are not Gaussian, most of the cases. I haven't seen yet, except from space data, that the tails are Gaussian. And when you're looking for small events, low signal to noise, it's gonna be in the tail. So if you don't get the tails right, you won't get a good measure of your actual p-value. So we move away from that and what we did, we went into the rank uh, statistics. So basically every point is ranked from the lowest point to the highest point. And now my new statistics is the sum of the ranks. Um, well, the advantage of this is that every light curve has the same distribution in the rank space. It's from one to n flat. There's no there's no distribution, basically. So anything I do f for one case, I can use for everything. You lose sensitivity because the lowest point doesn't matter if it's one sigma away or 25 sigma away. It's always the, the lowest point. Okay, so then we get into having fun because we wanted to see if we can calculate the null hypothesis of a random noise, meaning that there's no event, analytically, and we did. We found out that you can do that. It's the same way as, as doing the partitions of between zero and n, and then you multiply by w factorial, and then you subtract this to make sure that it goes from n minus w. Um, and then you calculate how much you subtracted, and uh, this is basically a q binomial coefficient, which you can even find in, in uh, in the textbook, and but to prove that we did some simulations. So you don't know if you can see here is the green and the red because uh, the green is, is actual um, what we calculated and the red is by simulating light curve. So I think we got it right. And here to calculate this Q polynomial coefficients, you use dynamic programming again because they're expensive to calculate, but using dynamic programming you can calculate. So this is on synthetic light curves. And we found one more good thing about that, that the, there is two things. There is, there is the, the position of the event and there is the width of that thing. And those two are three parameters you have to estimate. And the width, so it's just two dimensional optimization. But what we found, to our good surprise, this is where exploration comes in. This is the actual starting position, this is the width. What you see here, this is the value of the Q statistics. For a synthetic light curve, we make like that. But you can see the shape of this contour plot is very nice. So we can do optimization. We can do a gradient descent, and we did. So we could calculate all these all uh, things by just not exploring the whole space, by starting randomly somewhere and just explore around. So all this well, uh, and then we have to add one more component One more component, which is uh, sometimes we find multiple events, uh, meaning the algorithm will find two events which are the same event, but that was just a little pro clustering programming to take care of that. 
the good news is actually if there was a trend, we could even remove the trend. I mean, work with the trend available. And these are some real data. Um, so I don't have time to go through everything. Right? But let me pick what I'm going to talk. This is event detection due to the wavelet, but I think what Jeff talked earlier makes this a little bit lame. But it basically is, no? OK, someone says no. This is the basic idea using wavelets. I'm just going to describe in words. Uh, we use two level of wavelets, a low frequency and high frequency. We compare the fitting of the light curve to low frequency wavelet to high frequency wavelet. And if that, and if that um, fitting is it's large, if the discrepancy is large, we call it an event. Um, the problem with that is that we have, um, okay, so we need to distinguish, this is a nice plot, I like it. The little devil. So what we have here is basically, you need to distinguish if you have, let me show you something. This is the thing. If you have an event like that, or event like that, or noise, you need to be able to distinguish through these three. So if you have a, a light curve like that, you're going to have events, but you have to know that they have a lot of them. Um, so we did this um, two features, the QSUM statistics, this is a work with Alex Blocker. And the other one was um, finding the number of points above and the number of points below. And this is the two features plotted for all the macho light curves. And this line here basically is based on um, uh, synthetic light curves we did to find out where we should put that, that cut. And okay, so again, we did this and we found events in the error state I said in this case. Um, all these are known, actually. We found them again. But then we found a thing like so. So we're working on that one, understanding why it's there, why didn't they find it. And sometimes people get a little bit defensive about that. When we send them an email, say, what is that? And we need to look at the flags. There's always, th there's always this answer when I find something. The flags maybe show something else. So actually, what we're trying to do, get the actual images and look to see if something goes wrong. Um, and I think I should, no, I have 50 seconds. Am I over or am I above? Over. I'm over, okay, so, so I should stop. Okay, so I want to just mention a few things. Period finding, I can't talk about that, but this is the, the, my latest passion. Uh, as I said, we're trying to use new, tech, new approaches. I'm not selling it as the Panagia because we haven't confirmed yet that we're doing much better. Uh, actually, the last paper we used Gaussian process was rejected because he was not doing better than the Lomb's cargo. So, but it's new approaches, and I think it's going to take us some time to develop them further. Um, the one is to use Gaussian process to fit the data here. Um, my advisor, when I was a graduate student, he told me when you give a talk, 20% everybody should understand, 50% the expert should understand, and I keep adding 5%, nobody should understand except me. Uh, and then this one percent, which I don't understand, which is, I'm <laughs> not sure if I, <laughs> I, I'm getting there. So it's, the, the intuition of this Gaussian process has not settled very well, but I want to mention it. Um, I mean, I understand what's going on, but the intuition is not there. Um, and then down here is something I do understand. Instead of using the traditional way you use the autocorrelation, you get the power spectrum of the correlation and find out where the peaks are, and that's where your period. So we changed that to something called corentropy, which is basically you exponentiate again the whole thing. And that, what it means if you expand this in a Taylor series, what you find out is that you capture some of the nonlinear correlations, which usually the problem with the other correlation is just the only the linear correlation. Where here, if I expand this in a Taylor series, you start having higher order terms. And, and we're doing very well, actually. We, we've been and slotted core entropy means it's, we block it. Um, and I think I'm going to stop. And we're doing extensions now. We're using periodic kernels, the next one. And then we're using two kernels. One just takes the temporal variabilities. It's like deconvolving the, the sampling. And I'm just going to stop. I have enough. So one message after this is, I said, that it's happening now. We should be able to handle the new challenges. 
I want the serendipitous discoveries to be aided by all this news. Um, I think it's very exciting. And down here is kind of my message I want to see what people think, given what I hear so far. I think we're very close to have a method, maybe a bunch of methods, that will absorb any time series and give us at least a handle of the probability what it is. I think we combine all this work that we're going around. The problem is how do you combine them because the problem is getting the engineering money. But if we do, I think we're very close now to have something that you pass something and it gives you, okay, this is an AGN or this is a supernovae or this is something with a very high accuracy, I must say. And I'll stop here.